Good evening, everyone. This evening we celebrate the third Sunday in Ordinary Time. I invite you all to please stand and join in our opening hymn, Gather Your People. Forty days more, 
and Nineveh shall be destroyed. When the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and all of them, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw by their actions how they turned from their evil way, he repented of the evil that he had threatened to do to them. He did not carry it out. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Alexander Graham Bell was an amazingly talented person. 
invented the multiple telegraph, the audiometer used to test hearing, co-founder of the magazine Science, he served as president of the National Geographic Society. But of course, his most important accomplishment was the invention of the telephone. It made his family and his descendants enormously wealthy. But he almost lost it all. Bell never seemed to get around to filing a patent for his new invention. And his father-in-law, who had financed a lot of the research, got so impatient with him that he went and filed the patent on behalf of Alexander Graham Bell. He filed it on his birthday. Bell's birthday it was the 14th of February, 1876. He turned 29 years old. And it's a good thing that his father-in-law decided to do what he did, because a few hours later, a few hours later, another scientist by the name of Alicia Gray went into the patent office to get a patent on a machine he'd been working on for many years, the telephone. Well, some things are so important that we do need to act on them now. Some things have kind of a greater urgency to them. And in the gospel in we, that we hear in the call of the disciples, there is a kind of urgency. Those disciples abandon their nets. There's no delay. There's something so compelling about Jesus' invitation to follow him that they literally drop everything. And when they say that they dropped everything, when we read that they abandoned their nets, well, what were they leaving behind? Not just nets. They were leaving behind everything. They were leaving behind their livelihood. They were leaving behind their security. All that they relied on, what was essential to their life, what provided for their family. It was a rather radical, departure from everything they had known to follow Jesus. And so they have this invitation to become fishers of men. And we realize in that kind of urgent invitation, that immediate response, that abandoning their nets, we realize that there was a significant price attached to what they did. And it was a kind of costly decision that they were making. So choosing to follow Jesus as that disciple certainly was a costly, it had a price. And all of those early followers were willing to pay that price. The disciples, as we see them time and again in the Gospels, well, they're good examples for us in so many ways because they help us to see how we are called to live our faith because they're rather ordinary so many ways. They sometimes understand what Jesus is teaching them, and sometimes they don't quite get the message. Jesus pulls them aside, literally, and goes over further instruction, just like us. Sometimes we get the message straight on. Sometimes we need to be pulled aside to have it explained just a little bit. And just like us, they're very often loyal to the Master. But sometimes they're afraid. Sometimes they turn away from the Master, much like us. But in their response to the call that we hear in the Gospel today, this invitation, they really offer us a wonderful example of strength and decisiveness and conviction. That example of strength and decisiveness and conviction in living their faith and so as we look at their example, we might ask ourselves, well, how do we measure up? How are we responding? Are we responding as they did? Are we responding in a different way? How is it that we can follow the example of these disciples and not so much follow the example of Alexander Graham Bell, who procrastinated about something that was rather crucial, getting the patent? Or can we drop everything? as did the disciples. I suspect that one of the reasons why procrastinators 
do, in fact, put things off, even important things, is that they believe they have more time. And time, we come to realize, is not under our control. There might be more time, but there might not be more time. None of us knows the time when our earthly journey will come to an end. And so this kind of example of urgency on the part of the disciples is rather instructive for us. What in your life of faith is urgent? What in your life of faith is urgent? Is anything urgent or can't wait till another day? Can I do it somewhere later on? Have we put off reconciling with someone, for example? Now I'm going to get to that, but we're procrastinating. Maybe another day. Have we put off stepping up our practice of prayer, practice of reading scripture, delving into our beliefs in some way? Well, I'd like to get around to doing more of that. And why is it, my brothers and sisters, that we should see in these invitations, in these opportunities, a kind of urgent call? Well, as I mentioned, when we procrastinate, we think we are in control of time, and we're not. Perhaps the more important reason to act with this kind of urgency is really to make that mature commitment to be dedicated, to have that sincere response, because the message is so important. Because Jesus' message is so very important that we need to do it with a kind of urgency. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus lived and suffered and died for that message, and it is a reminder to us that there is something very important about it, something rather urgent about it, and we can summarize it in the, the twin command to love God and love neighbor. There's something important about doing it and responding to the invitation now. That's what the disciples teach us, I think, in the gospel today. When we think of the recent violence in our country, we go back over the last months. Some of the violence of the summer, some of the recent violence in our nation's capital, we all need to do a better job of loving our neighbor. There's a kind of urgency to that message when we see its opposite in operation. When we see the kind of disunity and violence and conflict, there is a kind of urgency about the message of loving our neighbor. And so our sincere effort to live out that twin command, a commitment to build up the kingdom of God, to create that better world that's based on love, love of God and love of neighbor, it's important for us and for those who will come after us. And certainly we come to realize in this time of pandemic something about urgency. Because as we see, people we know, perhaps people we've heard about, a friend of a friend, a friend of a relation, parent of a co-worker, I think the pandemic has touched us in ways we hadn't expected and brought home to us that sobering reminder of the fragility of our human lives. And in that, too, there is a kind of urgency that is presented. Richard Cardinal Cushing, who served as the Archbishop of Boston, once said the following, and I leave you with his words. He said, if all the sleeping folks will wake up and the lukewarm folks will fire up and all the disgruntled folks will sweeten up, and all the discouraged folks will cheer up, and all the depressed folks will look up, and all the estranged folks will make up, and all the gossiping folks will shut up, 
and the dry bones will shake up, and all the true soldiers will stand up, and all the church members will pray up, and if the Savior of all will be lifted up, then we can have the greatest renewal this world has ever known. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we come before God, the source of all goodness, we place our prayers and needs into his care. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, that he will continue to be a witness to the world that God's family is universal, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of nations, that they will strive to guarantee the rights of all peoples, rich and poor, young and old, unborn and disabled, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are very wavering in their faith, that they may be led to hope and renewal through our deeds and good works, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all first responders during this time of pandemic, especially doctors, nurses, law enforcement, emergency medical workers, military, nursing home workers, that they will be kept from all harm, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the intentions of our parish circle of prayer, and for all those impacted by the coronavirus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died, especially Robert A. Sherman, for whom we offer this Mass, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us to join in the work of establishing the kingdom. Hear us now as we turn to you with our needs. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Accept our offerings, O Lord, we pray, and in sanctifying them, grant that they may profit us for salvation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and eternal God, for you so love the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks. As an exaltation, we acclaim. Victim, 
by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Bernard, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope, Thomas our Bishop, Robert his assistant, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, we remember Robert A. Sherman. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy
Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. those who join us from home, we pray an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Blessed Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you are already there, I embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. So let me never be separated from you.